Great. Okay. Welcome everyone who's here. I'm sure some more people are going to come in. I think I said this already to everybody who is in the room now. Um, I'll be leading today's call. Joy's uh, out celebrating a friend's birthday today. So I'm really excited to be here and nervous. And so that's kind of what guided me in uh, in what I thought we would talk about today. Um, and what I wanted to talk about was cognitive fusion. And I don't know if anybody has has heard that term before. Does it has anybody heard that heard of cognitive fusion? So basically, it's that we our thoughts are who we are. Like our thoughts are our reality. And um, when Joy reached out, she reached out about an hour and a half ago and said, hey, listen, this is what's going on. I have a favor. Uh, I just got back from vacation and I would really like to celebrate a friend's birthday. And are you willing to lead today's call? So of course my knee jerk reaction, because I say yeah, like yes is an automatic response for me. So yes, sure, I will totally do that. I'm in, no problem. And then all of a sudden, my kind of the automaticity of the thoughts kind of kicked in, and I was like, "Whoa, wait a minute, what am I going to talk about? What? Wait, that that people are expecting joy, and this is not joy. And joy, I I don't have that beautiful accent and that that voice that joy has, and people are going to be so disappointed and. And so anyway, that when I kind of reached inside about what I wanted to talk about, I thought maybe that would be uh, a good topic for today's call, um, which led me down kind of a path of what is all of that, the automatic thoughts. And so that's when I came upon the cognitive fusion and there is a psychologist, what is his name again? I wrote it down. Um, I have it. Here. His name is Stephen Hayes. And so he uh, did a lot of research and came up with acceptance and commitment therapy, which talks a lot about cognitive fusion and basically the tactics to untangle ourselves from uh, the thoughts being who we are. So hence called diffusion. So um, I did want to share a little clip. This is something that pops into my mind um, a lot, just in terms of thoughts and how automatic they are and and kind of the 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 back and forth arguments that happen in your head. And I don't know if that happens for everybody else, but how many people have kids? Do you guys have kids? Yeah. Yeah. So Tangled is a kid's movie. <laughs> it's a Disney movie. I don't know if you've seen it, but I wanted to share a little a clip that really comes into my mind a lot about um, about my inner thoughts. And so I'm going to see if I can easily do this here. Share screen. Everybody. OK, so. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yep. OK, great. Okay, so basically, let me set the stage for you. So what has happened? This is Rapunzel. Rapunzel has been in her mother's tower. She has just gotten out of the tower. And this is what she's going through when she first gets out. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this. Mother will be so furious. But he doesn't know we'll kill her, right? Oh my gosh. We're gonna kill her. I am a horrible client. I'm going back. You know, I can't help but notice you seem a little at war with yourself here. What? Okay, so basically for me, that's an analogy. And this this comes up a lot for me because 
I feel like my, the inner dialogue in my head does that a lot, right? Like, yes, this is going to be great. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm doing this. How am I going to do this? I'm going to be such a failure. And so I'm just wondering if this is something that does everybody kind of go through this? Does it, does this seem, yeah, good. Okay. So I'm not alone. Um, I think about the clip from this movie a lot because I do feel like these uh, conflicting arguments happen in my head a lot. So I think it relates basically to this idea of, uh, of cognitive fusion and kind of detaching from our thoughts. Um, I thought that we would kind of go through what cognitive fusion is and why it happens. And then I have uh, an exercise that I thought we could do that just kind of demonstrates the idea of cognitive fusion. And then there are some tactics that I wanted to talk about uh, for diffusion, diffusion of thoughts. Um, and some of those are my own tactics that I've kind of collected and put into my toolbox over the years. And then there are a few others that I wanted to share that I have not tried that I thought were really interesting that I gathered in my research as I was preparing and cramming for this call in the last hour and a half. So uh, we'll kind of go through that and launch into that. So um, Stephen, as I had talked about, Stephen Hayes does a lot of work with acceptance and commitment therapy. Uh, also known as ACT. And so it's all built on the idea of this cognitive fusion, which I had mentioned earlier. So for anybody that's new, cognitive fusion is the idea that we are what we think, that reality is based on our thoughts. And I think it can be really hard to separate from that because we go through experiences in life and uh, so we have these resulting emotions or feelings. And so then they become memories. And then we continue to refer back to these experiences and they become automatic. And so that becomes our thought loop. Um, and then we just kind of become, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I know for myself, I don't know if you all uh, were on the call when I first joined Joy a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had talked a little bit about my own journey with depression and it is something that I have, uh, that I went through for 20 years. And I, I don't know if it's something that will ever be fully overcome, but I've done a lot of work in the last 10 years to overcome it. And a lot of that uh, incorporated these diffusion techniques. So learning to not be the product of my thoughts because for so long, um, what I formed as the basis of my thoughts became my beliefs, which guided my emotions and then my behaviors. And I looked for evidence to support all of those awful things I thought about myself. Um, so for me, overcoming depression was really at its core, trying to figure out how I could detach myself from, the, from those negative thoughts and not be one with them, which I just learned is cognitive fusion. Um, I'm looking at the comments. For me, it's the other way around. First, I think no, and then I think, oh yes, I can do this. Okay, um, yeah. But I think it is it is definitely like the dog chasing its tail, right? And it just goes back and forth, or I guess maybe more aptly named, like it's like the devil and the angel on my shoulder. You know, I have these two voices that are kind of saying, you know, you can do this. No, you can't. You're going to fail. No, you can do this. Um, so, so yeah, and then it becomes, it just becomes kind of that reality. And it's so easy. We don't, we don't want to do things. It's human nature. It's default to not do things that take effort. So we kind of allow ourselves to run on this automatic thought loop. Um, so so I think for me, the success in, in overcoming depression was to figure out how to detach from those thoughts. Um, so the exercise 
that I did before this call when I had decided that, okay, this is, you know, what am I going to talk about? Where am I? And I kind of just closed my eyes and tapped into what was I feeling, which is exactly when those thoughts kind of took over, you know, like, oh yeah, I can do this. Oh, wait a minute. What am I going to talk about? I can't do this. And so then I thought, okay, this is perfect. This is, this is exactly what I should share. I'm sure that lots of other people kind of experience this on a daily basis what with whatever fears or challenges might be present in your day today. Um, so the exercise was just to, to allow the thoughts to happen. And so for one minute, I tracked my thoughts. I, I allowed the, the kind of the angel and the devil to have their little arguments. And I just noticed and I wrote down those thoughts. So I'm going to be super vulnerable and share my one minute of thoughts with you guys. Um, the second time around, I did it. I did it as uh, I did it. And I tried to decide whether each thought was actually true and appropriate. And then I did it a third time. But when I read it, I was observing the thoughts as if I was kind of watching uh, my own kids or some somebody else. I was just an observer. All right. So where is my thought loop? Okay. Okay. So I kind of shared a little bit of this, but Joy, I was wondering if you would lead today's call. Sure. I can do that okay, that's happening in one hour and 45 minutes. What am I going to talk about? Wait, I can't do what Joy does. Oh gosh, her voice, it's, it's just so soothing and soft and beautiful and that accent, and I can't do that. But wait, I bring something to the table. I can do this. But what if they're, what if they're disappointed? What if they expect something else? I can't do the switch. I don't do that. I don't think I can lead it. I've never done that before. What if it doesn't connect? What if it's exactly what people need? So that was that was my one minute of thoughts. I couldn't really keep up with it. It's amazing how fast your thoughts are going. It, it's, they're going faster than my hand can write. So I'm sure that I missed a whole slew of uh inner critic, inner criticisms. Um, so then I thought about, okay, what would I, what would I tell anybody else? What would I tell my kids who are arguing like this? What would I tell a friend? Um, and I, you know, I think the, I think that's a rhetorical question. I think the answer is clear. I think all of us, when we are telling someone else, we do it with empathy and compassion and grace and forgiveness. And I have to ask myself, why don't, why don't we do that for ourselves? So in an effort to offer grace and empathy and compassion for myself, I am feeling the fear and I'm here anyway. <laughs> Okay, who's welcome? Yep, Bridget says I would I would say stop to all these thoughts. You're doing great. I you're you that's amazing. I think that or no, are you saying that to yourself or are you saying that to me or just both? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, I, I, my mind went to you were saying that to yourself because it's easier for me to offer grace to you and say, yes, that's great. You should say that to yourself. So I did want to share just a few things that, because this I think is, for me, was the core of my depression, was this inner critic this thought loop somewhere along the lines somebody told little dawn that she was something that made me interpret 
that she wasn't good enough. And it, it, it wasn't, it was nuanced. It never was. I, I was lucky. I didn't have somebody specific. My parents didn't specifically say you're not good enough. It was, it was more in sneaky terms that I then perceived to be about not being good enough. It was, oh, you're so stubborn. You're so emotional. You're so sensitive. If you're not happy, nobody's happy, you know? So it was these little seeds that were planted long ago that became beliefs about myself that I interpreted as being reason for feeling the fear. And they followed me well into adulthood. The very first thing that I feel was a game changer for me, and I and I and I'm fairly certain most people are familiar with this, was was the reframe. So it was being able to collect all of those seeds, all of those seeds that became self-doubt and unworthiness and fear and anxiety and figure out how I can reframe these things to be a strength and to be positive. So for me, it was saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not stubborn. I, I tend to like the word tenacious. I don't give up. I find solutions to problems. I'm proud of being emotional and sensitive. It allows me to have compassion for the world and help others. So when I was able to reframe all of those things and realize how they became my strengths, I was able to overcome those negative feelings. And along the way, I picked up something. I don't know if you all are familiar. I'm in marketing. So um, Marie Forleo, she's a marketing expert, but I, I feel like she's got so much that's psychology based, which marketing really is psychology based. But I watched a video I must 11 years ago that Marie Forleo did about overcoming fear specifically for videos and something that she said stuck with me. And I want to share that with you. Um, it's, it is the reframe, but she talked about the relationship between the thoughts and the physiological responses. So everybody kind of, I'm sure has something that happens a little bit different. Maybe it's butterflies in your stomach. Maybe it's clenched fists or jaw. Maybe it's sweating. You know, something physiological often happens in our body when we feel nervous. And so I remember her saying, notice those physiological responses and the thought that is associated with it. And so, you know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling nervous. And whenever you say I'm feeling nervous, come up with a substitute, right? Whatever that, that feeling is. And she said, oftentimes it could be a nonsense word. And her word was, and I, and I just use it for lack of creativity, but her word was Shazam. So instead of saying, I feel nervous, she would say, I feel Shazam. And so the idea was, how does that then feel in your body when you substitute it with this word? And I would try it, you know, instead of, you know, looking in the, looking at myself in the mirror and feeling the, the clenched jaw and the, the fists and the tightness in my belly and saying instead of, I feel nervous, which then kind of perpetuated those physiological responses. I feel Shazam. And magically, those physiological responses tended to lessen. And I know that sounds so silly. And, you know, you, I, I would be in my rearview mirror on the way to meetings that I was nervous about 
saying that. And I'm sure I looked absolutely insane talking to myself in the rearview mirror, but it genuinely helped me to reduce the physiological responses, which it's just a, a cycle, right? It's a perpetuating cycle when I think I'm nervous and then I start sweating and then I notice that I'm sweating and then I feel even more nervous about that. And so it just kind of keeps building. So that reframe in so many ways has been a saving grace for me. I don't know if that's something that I'm sure it's something you all have, you all have used. Does anybody have anything to add to the reframe or any experiences where that has helped you? I'd love to hear from somebody who also uses that. Does anybody else try that? No, has anybody used it? Just maybe even a show of hands. <laughs> Nobody does. You have. Okay. Can I pick on you, Carrie? Can you, will you share? Hi. Yeah. You're, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, it's not that I use a specific word for uh, the opposite of, of or something else, but uh, what I try... Uh, to do is when something happens, uh, when I feel uh, um, yeah, my English not so good as yours. That's okay. uh, uh, when you, when I want to do something and I'm scared to do it, then uh, what helps me is uh, what, do I, do, what do I have to lose? And that helps me always. Because when you then you see uh, in a uh, fast forward that you don't have to lose anything. Yeah, I love that. I, that, I that, love that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, or, you know, another question is what, and what do I usually, I'll ask myself that question and then I'll say, what do I have to gain? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that's, yeah. When you do that, uh, you train yourself to do that, then uh, your your world is getting bigger. And uh, well, I, I, the last year I uh, did an um, opleiding uh, training, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it it was challenging for me because it was new. Or, or everything was new, and the first day. Uh, the, the teacher told us, uh, okay, this and this and this, I expect you to do the last day. Or that you can do that the last day. And the first thing I was uh, thinking, I'm out. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I was uh, <laughs> so, so I get, uh, came home and uh, I sit, sit down for a minute and I thought by myself, what do I have to lose? And what can I learn? What can I give myself when I going to do this? So I make, uh, made the point for myself, uh, I'm, I can not do anything wrong. I only can learn. And and um, receive. Yes, absolutely. And what can I learn from this? Yes. Yes. It was a, a, I didn't have ever had such a beautiful training in these months because I was so open to, uh, to let it happen. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Being curious and open and what can yeah. you learn from it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That kind of leads me to my, the second thing that has helped me. It's something I, I, I think it was something that I had started doing was um, playing a, like playing scientist, 
right? So I started playing this little game with my thoughts, which is very similar to kind of what you're saying. Um, and I start, when I, whenever I would have those fears or those doubts, uh, they, they used to become so crushing, right? Like to the point where it actually felt like I, I could die, you know, like I, I, that sounds so drastic, but like, it just felt so crushing. Like, oh my God, this is failure is fatal. That's what it would feel like when those thoughts just kind of snowball and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, um, and so noticing how I felt and stopping myself in the moment and then playing scientist with myself. Okay, when, when has this happened in the past? When have I put myself out there outside of my comfort zone? What happened? And I, I haven't died, not yet. So I'm still, I'm still here. Failure is not fatal. I, I honestly, when I ask myself that question, I can't really remember anything being so awful that it created a memory that I should never do something outside of my comfort zone again. And when I start thinking like that, I think, oh my gosh, where in the world did I get these thoughts that it, I w- it was going to be so awful that it was going to ruin me somehow, ruin my life, you know? And, um, and when I play scientists and I start actually looking for evidence that support whatever thoughts those are, I realize often how irrational they are. So that's a huge, that's my second thing is playing scientists. And um, I do that one often. Um, the, the, and then after I play scientists, I think about like, okay, well, you know, if, if something, if something doesn't go exactly how I wish that it would, or something does happen, I try to then pull myself out of the situation and think about it. Uh, how am I going to feel about this tomorrow? Okay. I'm probably still going to be, uh, overanalyzing this and thinking about how I should have said this and I should have done this. Okay. Well, how am I going to feel about this? What about next week, two weeks from now? What about next month or a year from now? And oftentimes when I start to gradually bring myself out of it and look at it as an observer and think about how am I going to feel? Well, I can't, I can't remember people. People invite me on Facebook to be their friends. And I know I went to high school with them and I can't even remember who they are. So how am I going to remember what happened, you know, one year or five years from now? I'm we're not going to remember our memories fade, right? You know, it's not, it isn't as big as we think about it right now in this moment. And when I start to realize the reality of that, it makes it easier to, again, feel the fear and do it anyway. So those, the, the, those three things, there was one more Oh, I had talked about this a couple calls ago, which was specific gratitude. I've I've often heard, um, I know gratitude works. Um, and so oftentimes when I journaled my gratitude, I've done it many times and I've done it for many years. But one of the things that I realized recently within the last year was that oftentimes my gratitude was externalized. Like I was grateful I was grateful for my family. I was grateful for, you know, this beautiful day, right? It was always easier for me to be grateful about things that were, that really were out of my control, right? It was my, it was other people. It was easier just to kind of push that gratitude on other people. And what I noticed about my gratitude was that I was never expressing gratitude about me and what I bring to the world and who I am. And I'm, I'm grateful for, for me. And as uncomfortable as it was, even though nobody else sees my daily notes or you know, knew what I was saying, whatever, it was so uncomfortable for me to start writing down. I am so grateful that I am 
a strong individual or I am so grateful. And it was, it, of course, whenever something's uncomfortable like that, I think, okay, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing because it's uncomfortable. And, uh, which is so annoying. And I did that for days and I realized, because I think that what had happened, the reason I started doing this again was depression's a sneaky thing, right? You, you work on yourself and you feel good and you feel like you have a run of time where you're, I feel good. I feel good. Things are good. I'm manifesting amazing things in my life. And then just real sneakily, all of a sudden I'll notice after, and I'm sure it's been happening gradually, but I don't notice the gradual decline. And then all of a sudden I realize, man, I feel really crummy. And here I am back. I'm kind of back down in the well again. And I know this feeling. And so that was what spurred the idea to kind of, I actually was, was on the phone with um, my coach and this kind of resulted it sort of built into and evolved into this idea of specific gratitude. And uh, I just noticed that my thoughts were going to a place where they weren't serving me anymore. And so I started the specific gratitude and gradually again, I felt myself getting out of it. So I would share that with you all um, as an idea that helped me if it lands with you to start thinking about what about me am I grateful for? What are, what are five things about myself that I can express thanks for today and appreciation? Um, that has also, I think, helped me to diffuse, right? To, to not become one with that automaticity of the thoughts that I was having. So those were the four things, the reframe, playing scientist, bringing myself out of the time, this current time and bringing myself kind of the future. How will I feel about this in the future? And uh, the specific gratitude. So those are my four strategies that I've used to be able to do cognitive diffusion. Now, I did want to mention a, a few of the things that I read about today as I was kind of researching the cognitive fusion ideas, and they're interesting. So I wanted to share them with you. These are not things that I have tried. So I'll share them with you as a like a group. Perhaps it's something that we try together. Um, the first thing, which I thought was super interesting, because I feel like it actually kind of goes against what I have often thought to be true, but the first one is disobeying on purpose. So this Stephen Hayes, this guy who I was talking about, who does all this work with cognitive fusion, suggested that we disobey on purpose. So basically saying one thing and then doing the opposite. So um, saying, uh, if you get up and you walk around the room and saying, I cannot walk around the room while you're walking around the room. To me, that just felt so um, antithetical to what I honestly believed in terms of saying like, I can, I am doing this, right? I And so it just, it was interesting to me, but interesting enough to like, okay, I, I'll try this because there is supposedly some scientific research that says they, a group out of Ireland did some research um, that basically had people touching a hot plate. And while they were touching the hot plate, they were saying, uh, I cannot keep my hand, something to the effect of, I cannot keep my hand on this hot plate while keeping their hand on the hot plate. And, and people were 40% were able to keep their hand on the hot plate 40% longer when saying that they couldn't do it. That kind of blows my mind a little bit. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mean, it just seems, um, it seems like I said, antithetical to like the whole I can and I am uh, attitude, but apparently it's supposed to illustrate 
our mind's power over our thoughts and show how that power is just an illusion. Um, so I'm sharing that with you as, as just sort of a, a curiosity. I am going to try that and see what happens when I say I can't do something while I am doing it. So that was that was the first additional thing. The other one was giving your mind a name. So I did. I have not addressed her yet, but her name is now Penelope. So the idea is that it separates your mind from who you are. Your thoughts are not who you are. It's now Penelope speaking. <laughs> it's, not, it's not Dawn, it's Penelope. So you're supposed to address your mind from, you know, okay, Penelope, I hear what you're saying. So again, the idea is, is that you're diffusing from uh, the idea that you are one with your thoughts. So I'm going to try that one as well. These are the four things that I'm going to try. This one I've heard before. I don't know that I've actually put it into practice. And I know that even, I know Joy has said this before. It's appreciating, it's appreciating your thoughts, whether or not they're serving you or not, you know, and it can be, it can be sarcastic appreciation, right? Thank you. Thank you for your input. I know you're here to serve me and protect me. And I'm going to put this right here. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, again, I'm going to try appreciating and noticing and appreciating what my thoughts, what they think their purpose is, right? What their, how, why they've been created. And the last one is to, to sing it. And this is another one that I thought was interesting because Joy does this too. And I don't know if she's ever actually explained why she's done it. Maybe you guys have heard her say that, but she does that a lot. I hear her kind of in a sing-songy voice, like, you know, okay, I am not... I am a failure. I am, I am nervous. I am scared, you know? So that was the, that was the last piece. And the idea behind, I think the idea behind that was primarily to, um, again, change the physiological responses. So detaching from, uh, detaching from the thought and being an observer. So there are eight tips on cognitive diffusion. Four of them are mine that I have built up in my, well, I don't know that they're mine. I don't know that any, honestly, I'm not sure that there's any unique thoughts. I think we all build off, my belief is that we all build off little snippets of inspiration that we've received over our lifetime. And I don't know if anybody's read Liz Gilbert's uh, The Big Magic, I think is what it's called. But she talks a lot about that, about how there are kind of ideas there in the air and we just kind of pick and build upon them and make them our own. But anyway, four of them are not mine, but they're things that I've used for decades. And then four of them are things that I collected to share with you today that I'm interested in trying. And so if any of those land with you, um, the idea is that we can get out of the automatic thought loops that are not serving us in the best way and step into our power and kind of hold the pen, right? Be able to rewrite not only what's happening to us now or what will happen to us, but I believe that when we pick up that pen, I believe we can actually rewrite things that have happened to us already because it's about changing the perception and changing the experience. And I've tried this a lot with all of those things that have been said to me or happened to me over the course of my life to reframe them and write, rewrite them in a way that maybe diverges from the thought paths that I took and became who I was. I rewrote them in a way that took me down a different path and I do believe that by doing that on some levels, I've been able to maybe not change what happened in all those years, but change my perception of them. Um, so 
I had no idea how long things were going to take. And I am speaking to y'all and I'm winging a prayer and what's going on inside right now. Um, so I know we're a little bit early, so I'd love to open it up if anybody has any comments or their own experiences or their own strategies. I'd also love just to know more about you. Um, I recognize a lot of your faces from the last few weeks. And so if anybody is brave enough to unmute their mic and share, I would be, yeah, okay. Thank you, Ethel. Um, I, I have, when you uh, talked about the first point you uh, haven't um, 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 tried, I remembered Mark Abrahams, who said, when you are in a, a thought carousel, you should look at a um, table and call it another name, but loudly. So you look at the table and call it ball, or you look at a stool, uh, a, um, a chair, and um, call it fruit, uh, fridge, or freezer, or something what does not have uh, this is the same and you you stop the uh, the thoughts and you can come to um to ease and calm down that's fascinating you understand yeah it? yeah i do I, I totally understand and i wonder if a lot of that has the same basis for the idea i think of, it's the same you know yeah i cannot do this but you're doing it anyway so it's 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 kind of the minds way of tricking us right yeah. like if we it's a tactic to trick our minds really yeah. uh, and I, I i can see that and i find that really interesting you know it's i think that it's so much easier when the actions are aligned with the thoughts and that's often what happens so i see what you're saying basically it's like disrupting yeah. that can you know the uh congruity is that a word what's the word i'm looking for the you know congruence that's the word i'm yeah, looking yeah. for yes <laughs> yeah thank you thank you for sharing and thank you 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 are fabulous oh thank you i appreciate that very much i'm excited i'm really excited to be here with you all and um i just i i do love showing up to these calls i feel like i take something every time. And I'm sure that we can all relate to that. I think that any time that we show up and we're vulnerable and, uh, and we're able to share with one another and share our experiences, we're able to somehow apply that in different ways to our own lives. And hopefully, you know, I, that my greatest hope in what I've shared today is that it does land in some way, um, that does maybe align with whatever you all are all going through. Does anybody else? I feel like I'm chatting. I'll challenge you. Is anybody else brave enough to unmute their mic and share? How about if I just ask some easy questions? I can. Oh, good. I can take the challenge. Um, yeah, it's normally, you can also say some degrees. You give uh, a degree. Um, I know it is in, in Flemish, but uh, in Dutch, uh, I try to, to translate it. And I don't know it's real good English, but uh, it's with the word starting stop. <laughs> stop, not in my life world, in my uh, environment, stop this. That's for a situation that uh, is not uh, a good thing. It's not for your thoughts, but uh, when something happens and you see a disharmony around you that you say, stop, not this in, in my world, turn this uh, situation in the opposite direction and I and create a, a miracle. But then I'm in connection with my higher self, something like this. Yes, yeah, stepping into your power. Yeah, realizing realizing that you have the power to step into your power. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that. Thank okay. you. Thank you for You're being welcome. brave. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes.
So I'll ask some easy questions just because I would love to really hear and I really would love to hear and know you. Tell Lisa, tell me where you are and where you're where you're in, joining us from. I'm from Italy. Tell me where that is. Italy. Oh, Italy. Oh, on my bucket list. Yes. I'm, I'm Italian American. My grandparents um, were immigrants from Italy in the 20s. Yep. That's so, nice. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Yeah. Nice to meet you. You are great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Luana, tell me where you're from. I'm Lisa's sister, so I'm from Italy as well. Oh, <laughs> what are the chances that I would literally pick the two siblings in the entire group? That's great. That's perfect. Well, it's very nice to meet you. Yeah. Yes. I, yes. Yes. Danielle, that's my, speaking of, that's my sister's name. Tell me where you're joining from. Uh, you you mean uh, you mean me? Yes. Yeah, uh, from Italy as well. Actually, I'm on uh, another. Oh. oh wait, no, Danielle. Sorry, I was looking oh. at Danielle. That's my sibling's name. Yes. Oh, okay. My name. Your name. I'm I'm, I'm from Holland. You're from Holland. I yes. know there are quite a few. I noticed the Dutch, the Opleiding. When you said Opleiding, I was like, I know that word. I've been working for. <laughs> I've been working for Roy and Joy for, well, 10 years now. So mm -hmm. I, I'm starting to write, just pick up a few Dutch words. Yes. <laughs> Very few. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, I, I would, if I could, totally do the switch and do the whole, you know, I fear and then I am and all that stuff, but I have followed joy now for so long. I've, I feel like I should be able to do it, but I can't, but um, I would just kind of send you off on your way in terms of doing joy work to think about those thought loops and maybe do an exercise where you're journaling your thoughts. If it is something that, that you feel Oops. you benefit from. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah. And then anything else? Oh, what else do we have? Somebody said um, integral eye movement therapy imprints are reframed. Can somebody tell me more? Carrie, can you tell me more about that? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's uh, it's a therapy when um, it we can use it for uh, depressions burnouts, uh, unliked feelings, anything, anything, uh, what, um, how do you say it in English? Um, anything, uh, what bothers you in, in the now, in this yeah. life, um, We look, we, we uh, from the uh, emotion or the feeling, we uh, search for the imprint, for the memory. Mm -hmm. And when you think of the memory, we do eye movements while you think of the memory. Mm -hmm. So it, there are new uh, uh, brain, uh, Neural pathways. Ne neural pathways, yes, because your brain is a uh, neuroplastic. So then your uh, your way of experience what happens in the past uh, it changes. Yeah. Okay. So it, this was done. Yeah, in it, reference it to being changed, able to change. Yes. And it changes in the blink of an eye because when I, I'm I'm a I'm, I'm doing that. <laughs> so and when it, it's literally a blink in the eye, what we see, what tells us that it's changed. So it's so changed. Yes, it's, it's yeah. fascinating. 
It is so fascinating too. I these are the things that I'm I have been taking now that I'm going back to school and I took neuroscience. I thought neuroscience was going to be more psychology based, but it's more of a cellular like these these people are typically pre-med or pharmaceutical like it's it's really about mm -hmm. the biological cellular processes and stuff like that. But um cognitive psychology I, what I took was more about that, like the memories and, and how they're imprinted in our mind. And, but, I and, and integral, eye, integral eye movement therapy is, is working on the uh, unconscious mind. So you, you, you don't have to speak. It's just uh, in trans language, you go to your uh, subconscious mind mm -hmm. and then it changes everything. That's so fascinating. I'm going to have to yes. read more. I'll read more about that. And that is what you do. Yes. That's yes. really neat. Cool. I want to read more it's about that. Really cool. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Welcome. And thank you for sharing all what you have told us. Yeah. Well, I, I have loved being here with you all today. I will be back next week. Joy will be back in the driver's seat and I will be supporting her. Um, I, I, I love that you all were here and engaged and open and flexible and so compassionate for the changes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate each one of you. I will go ahead and I will, I'll sum up the things that we talked about and we can send that in an email uh, with the recap and the replay of the call. For anybody that is listening, we will, uh, we will share that via email. So if you're on the list, but if you're on YouTube, we'll go ahead and share a link to that as well. And we'll be back same time next week. Does anybody have anything else that they can, that they would like to share before we go? Yes, can, can I uh, get into the email again? Absolutely. Yes. Irene, I will make sure that you are on the email. Can you drop your email address to me in the chat so I can? Yes. Sure I will that do that. You? Yeah. Okay. Go back on. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.